This is four. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the light microscopy, right? So we talked a little bit about bright field, dark field, phase contrast, DIC or Nomarski. And um, so now we're talking about fluorescence. So that's these guys right here. And uh, fluorescence microscopy is actually really cool. And actually we've been able to do a lot with this basic technology. So one of the things that came along with molecular biology and advancements in molecular biology is we learned to make what we call fusion proteins, uh, which is like one protein fused to another, um, basically. And so they kind of go along as a package deal. But along with that technology, we also realized that we can fuse other things to a particular protein of interest, right? Say, for instance, a fluorescent molecule or a fluorescent tag or something that we can basically look for, grab um, out of the pile of proteins that you would have in a cell. And so along with this, say, for instance, if you've got a particular protein that you want to study, and you want to study like where is it made in the cell, like when during the cell's life cycle is it made, those sorts of things, then we figured out a way to put this big fluorescent tag on it. <clears throat> sometimes it's another protein. Uh, sometimes it just is a fluorescent molecule on its own, right? Um, but what this does is basically kind of create like a little tagging system for this particular protein. So now wherever this protein is made, our little tag will go along with it. So it's kind of a way to highlight where this protein is made. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. So here you can see you've got basically some sort of a protein um, the, in the yellow that has been tagged with some sort of a fluorescent molecule. And generally, we already talked about fluorescence, didn't we, right? Fluorescence is basically UV radiation, usually, beaming on a molecule, exciting the electrons. The electrons jump up. And when they fall back down, they emit a fluorescent photon of light, right? Now that's exactly what you're seeing here. So what this requires then is typically something um, above visible, right? So that's one of the reasons why it's not part of the light microscopy section is because it usually utilizes UV radiation. And so you, along with these fluorescent microscopes, you have things like UV lamps and stuff like that. So you can beam this high energy light onto it get those electrons to absorb that energy, they jump up, they fall back down, and they emit this fluorescent light. And if you are a fluorescent molecule, then you are fluorescing wherever you're tethered. That is wherever this protein is. And that's what you're seeing. So here you're seeing, it looks like a generally cytoplasmic protein in what looks like a neuron. And then the pink, that's colored, that's not real. Um, that's actually DNA. So that kind of shows you where the nucleus is an enormous stride in molecular biology because what this has allowed us to be able to do is not just characterize proteins in terms of their function, but also in terms of their location. And it has allowed us to actually do what we did with animals, right? I mean, so by the time we got to molecular biology, we'd already learned a lot about animals and animal behavior. How did we do that? We just went to where the animals lived, right? And we just hunkered down there in our blinds. And if you're doing good all, you just sort of became one of the you know, gorilla family, um, right? So, I mean, that's kind of what you did, but you basically lived in and among those animals and you just observed their day-to-day -day routines, right? That's how you learned about animal behavior. This allowed us to be able to do on a molecular level, the exact same thing with proteins. So now if you want to know what a protein does, just highlight it with a fluorescent molecule and observe it in different stages of life. Um, and you'll learn a lot about that protein. <coughs> And what it does. And so this has given us an enormous amount of information. And so this is just like if you're using just a, a basic um, UV uh, lamp, right? However, because your resolution of your image is based on the amount of scatter, or in this case, the amount of focus that you can uh, put on scattered light, right? Remember, we talked about the condenser lens. In the microscope, the condenser light takes the scattered light, which creates a very fuzzy, blurry image, and then kind of corrals that light into a more focal beam so we can get a little bit more sharper perception of that particular image. Uh, your eyes, by the way, do the same thing. That's the same set of physics that your eyes are doing as well. That's the reason why you can see things because you have um, a pupil that's able to sort of cinch down on that amount of light like a condenser lens and kind of give you a bit more focal um, resolution. 
Well, let's take that idea of focusing scattered light to get better resolution to its extreme degree. The ultimate source of focused light is a laser. This is as focused as you can get. It's basically a stream of photons. And what it does is it gives you this titanic resolution. So here is basically the same cells, neurons, stained with the same thing, only instead of using just a UV lamp shining on it, you're using a laser beam of UV radiation shining on it. And you can see the amount of clarity that it gives you. So this is what's called confocal microscopy. Tremendously clear, tremendously detailed, tremendously expensive. Um, so these are hard. You're not going to see these in just a general bio lab. Um, as a matter of fact, even at Anschutz, the confocal microscope that they use there is usually a, the property of multiple labs. So it's like not just any person's microscope. It's like part of a group of labs that all pitched in money to purchase this confocal and also to hire technicians to keep it um, working. Exactly. And that's kind of what you do. You pool your resources together with other labs because you all have use for a confocal, for instance. <clears throat> or you may see that you may have use for a confocal and you want to pitch in some money for that. And so these are really, really huge. Uh, fluorescence microscopy is like super fun um, because you get to look at pictures of cells and they're colorful like naturally, you don't have to like colorize them. They're like colorful. Um, and they have not only that, but they're colorful for a reason, right? So they actually give you information. And so we've learned a lot. This is a very powerful field is fluorescence microscopy, very, very uh, uh, fruitful field for study. We've learned a lot from it, but not as much as we've learned from electron microscopy. So here's your electron microscopy types, right? So here's your transmission electron microscopy. You can see you're beaming electrons through what looks like a cross section of a cell. Um, and notice those cells look a little more defined now, right? Rather than just the amorphous bubbles that you see up here in bright field, right? Now you can kind of see there's actually some definition to those bubbles. You can see that not all the bubbles are alike. And so you can start to sort of tease apart the different types of organelles in here. And it actually gets better than this. This is actually a fairly low resolution electron micrograph. You can actually get one of these organelles and blow it up. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, magnification range, a typical bright field image is magnified maybe a thousand times, right? 100 times 10. Um, that's pretty good. An electron micrograph, especially one where you can see like the mitochondria up close and the organelles up close, you're probably talking about in the hundreds to 200 thousands times magnified. So they're like really blown up hugely. Um, this one here is the scanning. So you can see it looks like, you know, you've got basically this sort of what it would look like if you were to miniaturize yourself and sort of go stand next to it. It's like, oh, look at that the cute little furry creature, right? So this is basically what it looks like from the outside. This is that one where it's glanced, all those electrons are glancing off the surface, having given you a three-dimensional topographical view of things. Very, very helpful. Um, especially if you're looking for surface structure and you're trying to analyze surface structure. Um, the transmission is good if you're looking at internal structure. Okay. So those are your types of microscopy. So um, let's take a look at some, some similarities for all cells, right? So everything we already learned this about the in, the in the terms of the cell cycle. So everything is made of cells. Everything is alive, that is to say, is made of cells. Um, but all these cells in the world are not all the same, right? There's two major groups of them. And we've talked about that a little bit already. Um, but all cells have some things in common. So if you're going to be a cell, you have to basically have these in common. First of all, you have to have some sort of centrally located genetic material. Now, notice it didn't say that you have to have a nucleus. It just says you have to have some central location. I would argue that the real emphasis on this first one is the genetic material in the first place. So that is to say that you have to have DNA. Or maybe RNA, but mostly DNA. Okay. Now, what does that mean? This is such so fundamental, right? That Basically, we can define living organisms by 
the presence of DNA. Think about it, right? How did we define a genome? It's basically all the genetic information that you have, right, for your personal genome, which is everything, all the information you need in order to build you from scratch. It's all there, right? Not only that, but if you're a living organism, you have to have a blueprint, right? Just like every building across the street in downtown Denver, that way, <laughs> right, has to have a blueprint, right? Every single one does. As a matter of fact, you can even, you can even go as far as to say that if you find a blueprint, then there's evidence of a building somewhere, right? So that's evidence of you being a building. The same thing's true here, right? I mean, it's so fundamental that you have to have your information in order to be able to build you. It makes a lot of sense, right? If you don't have that information, guess what? You're not going to get past square one. So DNA is an absolute requirement for all living organisms, even to the point where it actually defines life. Because all living things need a blueprint, okay? Now, what else do we all have in common? Well, cytoplasm. So cytoplasm is the stuff inside the cell. Right? That's a non-technical version of it. So what does that mean? Well, there's two different things that are inside the cell. And there's a couple of terminology things that I wanna clear up because one I use uh, frequently and the other one I don't use hardly at all. And this is the idea of the cytosol versus the cytoplasm. So the cytosol is the fluid inside the cell. The cytoplasm is the fluid plus the organelles and everything else. Okay. Now, here's the problem with that. The term cytosol is a little bit of a geriatric term. So if I hear somebody saying cytosol, I know that either you are an old timer or you learned your biology from an old timer because most practicing cell biologists will never use the term cytosol they will always use the term cytoplasm. And the reason for that is because when you take a look at a cell, you actually saw it with the electron micrograph, right? That's not like there's a bunch of open fluid inside the cell. The cell is crammed with organelles. So the term cytosol is really kind of a, a neutered term. Really what you have inside a cell is the cytoplasm. And most cell biologists, even the ones at Anschutz, will refer to the cytoplasm. The only time, and actually Catherine Howe, who's like one of the big shots over at Anschutz in terms of cell biology. Um, and so she would talk about, she always talked about cytoplasm. The one time, the few times that I heard her talk specifically about cytosol, she was making a point, a distinction between cytosol and cytoplasm. So she was specifically talking about the fluid, not all of it. So that was the only time I ever heard her talk about cytosol. Uh, most new generation researchers don't use that term. Even when we're talking about the fluid of the cell, they talk about the fluid of the cell. <laughs> so they don't really use that term cytosol oftentimes. So like for me, for instance, I usually will always use the term cytoplasm, okay? Um, and so that's kind of uh, the idea that we have. And of course, in that you have organelles and things of that nature. And then of course, the other thing we all need to have is a plasma membrane, gotta have it, right? Because after all, we've just been talking about stuff inside the cell. So now you need the actual cell itself, which is bounded by the plasma membrane, which we already learned, we get for free during the formation of the phospholipid bilayer, right? So that was that whole mo lesson in, in Mozart and compositional technique, right? Which you guys should be lucky and be, and be thankful that you weren't the Monday, Wednesday section who just got done with their lab about an hour ago because I just went over the whole Mozart thing with them this morning and during their lab, they got to listen to Mozart like all lab long. So um, it, it is, Lovely. yeah, it is unless you're like a metalhead. Um, but I don't really care because well, you know, anything written What's largely. Exactly my point. Dude, what? What's, uh, what's metal that's fundamental to the See, exactly, right. 
that is a well-grounded music student. Unfortunately, most uh, writers of music today just basically dumb luck their way into their songs. Yeah, it's like they, the way they write is like they're falling out of a plane and they just happen to bounce on the earth. Um, most writers actually go splat. If you think about how many people are out there writing songs and how many actually make it. Um, that's less true for composers. Because even the most minor of composers, like Salieri, for instance, who's a contemporary of Mozart, actually, when you listen to music, it's actually like, this is pretty tightly wound. This is pretty good. You just happen to be unfortunate enough to live at the same time as Mozart. Yeah. Um, that was the unfortunate piece there. But yeah, no, that's it's all good. Whereas in modern music, it's like, no, this is like an ocean of crap with an occasional lucky tune in there. Um, so. Exactly, or in this case, a manuscript. Yeah. Okay, so a score of some sort. Um, so let's take a look at the prokaryotic ones, right? So we're going to spend most of our time talking about eukaryotes. So we're going to give the prokaryotes a little bit of love. By the way, if you get your geek on with prokaryotes, then you need to take micro. That's basically prokaryotes from the beginning to end. That's all basically general biology for prokaryotes. Okay. So we're just going to cover a couple of basics. And this is kind of a common pattern. So we're going to start a pattern now that is gonna be common all the way throughout. That is to say, as we start to learn mechanisms of the cell, um, then what we notice is a common pattern that we first of all learn about those mechanisms in prokaryotes first, because they were very simple organisms. And then we transferred that knowledge to eukaryotes and kind of expanded on that theme. That's a very common pattern that we're gonna see. We're gonna start that pattern now. So let's first of all, take a look at the prokaryotes. So they're simple little guys, right? They don't have a nucleus. Uh, they don't have any, um, organelles, so don't have any of those. Um, they do have a central location though, they have to, right? The central location for them is like called the nucleoid. Now there's nothing special about it. It's just an area of the cell that they just kind of toss all the DNA in, right? It's kind of like if you were uh, in a college dorm or something like that, and you don't have a closet, then you know all the clean clothes technically have a place to go. They go into sort of the Southeast corner of the floor, right? But it is a place, right? Because you have a dirty pile in the Northeast corner of the floor. And you don't want to mix the two up, right? So that's kind of one of those controlled mess dorms kind of a situation, right? Um, so you have a place to put it. It's just not an actual organized structure to put it into. And in addition to this, they also have a cell wall, but not like eukaryotic cell walls. and they contain ribosomes. So let me tell you something. <clears throat> to get out of the gate, there's a couple things you have to have. You have to have the components of a cell, right? You have to have a cell membrane. That's a easy one, right? You have to have DNA. You don't have DNA, you're, you're as good as dead. And you have to have ribosomes. Why? because ribosomes are the factories that make proteins. So if you don't have a factory to make your protein, guess what, you're not gonna get proteins. If you don't have proteins, you're not gonna be able to do any of those jobs that we associate with proteins, which every cell has to do. Which means you're not gonna be able to answer any of those big biological questions of life, are you? Which means you are dead, right? So this is entry level. I mean, this is like the beginning. I mean, if you can't get past this one, turn it all off because it's not going anywhere, right? You gotta have DNA, you gotta have a membrane, you gotta have ribosomes. It's must have material. That's minimal requirement. So prokaryotics have all the basics, um, but prokaryotic cells can be split into two different categories. I remember we talked about taxonomy. We talked about the first question was, uh, are you a prokaryote or eukaryote? That splits you into two uh, domains actually split you into three domains. It used to split you into two domains, but now split you into three domains, right? One prokaryotic, one eukaryotic, but there's two prokaryotic domains. Why? Because recently we discovered that half of the, not half the prokaryotes, but some of these prokaryotes are kind of a little bit different, right? So they kind of have some differences to them. That's the archaea group. And then of course you have traditional bacteria, things like E. coli, salmonella, that sort of stuff. Um, but archaea are weird because the, you only find them in extreme environments, right? Deep sea thermal vents, things like that, right? So these tend to be extremophiles, so not normal stuff. 
but really fascinating if you think about it in terms of evolutionary biology, because the idea is that the primordial atmosphere probably was a pretty extreme environment. So here you have a group of prokaryotes that potentially could have made a go of it in an extreme environment, right? So that's always, and that's kind of just BSing, right? That's just spitballing. That's not an actual thing. Um, that's just, you know, yarn spinning is what that one is. That's just the way the yarn spin goes. And that's because this is like preposterously far back um, to where we don't really know exactly how it went. We just know it's here now. Um, what? Yeah, yeah, it happened because it's here. We know that much, but we just, we're not sure how exactly it happened. Um, but it's kind of a, an option, a possibility. Right. So it's like maybe everything was archaea first. I don't know. Uh, there's like multiple versions of all of that. So this is basically your prokaryotic cell. If you take a look at it, we're going to move to the inside out. We're going to start, first of all, with uh, this guy right here. So that is all your DNA. It's all piled up right there in the center. That's your nucleoid region with all of your DNA in it. Right. That's kind of your southeast corner, your dirty laundry pile. Right. I think I switched corners on you guys, didn't I? Southeast used to be clean. But anyway, um, you also have these little pink dots, which look kind of like chicken pox. <laughs> these are the ribosomes. So notice even prokaryotes, even the most basic and fundamental, simplest organisms have to have those ribosomes. So it's very, very fundamental. Um, and then as you start to move outward, you're going to notice you got fluid inside this chamber. That's your cytoplasm, right? Notice they've already done the same thing here. So they even instead of saying cytosol, they said cytoplasm because they're talking about everything inside. And then as you keep moving out, this little gold layer right there, that's your plasma membrane, which is on the inside of a cell wall. And then outside that cell wall is a capsule. Now the cell wall is for protection. And so is the capsule. So you have an extra capsule. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's gelatinous. It can be different textures, but it's basically an external layer that basically kind of surrounds the bacteria. And then from uh, these layers will grow these long protein-like projections called pili, um, which is what we saw before. So remember the electron microscope? We saw the little furry guy. That's probably pili on a bacterium that we're looking at. But these pili will do different things. So these um, will allow you to be able to attach to things. Uh, they'll also be able to allow you to interact with other bacteria. For instance, they, like, uh, the way bacteria mate is they can swap DNA back and forth by using what's called a conjugation pillus. So they just basically take their two pili, they kind of connect them together to create a long tube, and they can transfer little pieces of DNA. And, and there's, there's specific types of DNA in a bacterium that's not associated with this piece right here that they can swap back and forth. It's called a plasmid. And that's, you know, they're not showing that. Technically they probably should. There's these like little circles of DNA. And these you can swap easily between bacteria. So you have your main genome, that one you keep. You don't move that one around, that's yours, right? Unless it's like mutation or something like that. But then you have these like little itty bitty circles, kind of like currency, where you can kind of swap them kind of back and forth between each other. Oftentimes you'll find on these little plasmid circles of DNA, things like antibiotic resistance genes, um, there's mating strains on these types of genes, which bacteria kind of have, they don't have male and female, but they have different strains like F and F prime. It's kind of like a kind of a male, female sort of a thing. They're complementary mating types. So like an F prime would always conjugate with an F and that gets deeper into bacterial genetics and things like that. But the idea is to understand that this, this genome that's inside the nucleate region isn't the only source of DNA in a bacteria. And this will become important later on in the semester when we start looking a little bit more, actually in not in the semester, but actually in the chapter, in this chapter, a little later on, we'll take a look at what that means and consequences. So I want to break that in. That's a very bacterial thing to do. We don't have that. We have two sources of DNA as well, but our DNA is mostly 
nuclear. We don't have like little circles that we swap back and forth like bacteria do. Or do we? Okay. Um, so not necessarily, if, let's say this bacteria here uh, mutated to be more resistant to people. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an offspring, but it's also resistant, but that also the one to move out of the other like heavy chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you swap that resistance gene back and forth, you could. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to. I mean, conjugation is not like us because bacteria are asexually reproducing. So they don't need to do that. There's no pressure to do that. They can, they can manage just fine. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so that's kind of what they, and that's how they grow mostly. But they do do a little bit of conjugation, but it's not like a lot. Right. So most of, so like a lot of bacterial resistance you see is basically just the mutation rate that's creating resistance. And then just that one bacteria survives and it just clonally divides into a new population of bacteria that's stronger than the previous. So that's usually what happens. It's like natural selection, high speed. That's kind of what it's like. So that's your basic uh, prokaryotic bacterial cell. Now let's, let's kind of talk a little bit about this cell wall nonsense, shall we? Because uh, we already know a couple of things that have cell wall, right? We already know that um, plants have a cell wall. We already know what that cell wall is made out of, right? What's that cell wall made of out of plants? Cellulose, right? We also know that fungi have a cell wall. What's the fungi cell wall made out of? No, that's that's the those are the growing the growing fibers of a fungus. That's actually pretty cool, but no, um, that's uh, you're getting all mycology on me there. But what's the fungal cell wall made out of? We didn't really talk about it as, as a fungal example. We talked about it as the other example, the other organism that has this. Huh? Yeah, chitin. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's made out of chitin, right? Those are both your structural carbohydrates, right? Um, so that's those made out of. And so this is different, right? So the cell wall of a bacterium is made out of a different one. It's a peptidoglycan. So peptido for protein, glycan for glycogen. So this is a carbohydrate. So it's a protein carbohydrate fusion molecule that forms kind of the network of what becomes the cell wall of the prokaryote. Now we don't get into the cell wall a whole lot because in micro you get into a lot of it, right? That's actually how we organize and how we categorize different um, prokaryotes. Um, and so that's a, that, that's a topic that will get very deep in, um, in micro if you take micro. So the cell wall is basically there for the same reason the plant cell wall is, and that is for protection. Protection primarily, but also maintaining its shape. So once you have a nice little shape for a prokaryote, then um, that's going to help protect you. But also for water uptake, right? So, so you don't blow up. So you also kind of resist lysing. So basically bursting. That allows you as a prokaryote to basically swim around in a lake without exploding because you got that nice, strong, rigid cell wall to sort of protect you, okay? And you're not going to, regardless of the water pressure, you're not gonna blow through that, that cell wall, okay? It's just like uh, these walls here are strong enough to resist changes in air pressure, right? You're not gonna blow, you can, you can change the air pressure in here all you want. You're not gonna blow through these walls. I mean, let's put it this way. If you got to an air pressure that would blow through these walls, we'd all be dead. Right before that happened. Yes, right. But the, you have a obviously you have a limitation. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, in general living environments, you don't have to worry about air pressure in this room because the walls structure exceeds that pressure. Same thing's true for the bacterial cell wall. You don't have to worry about water pressure coming in or out of the cell. It doesn't really matter because your cell walls are going to maintain your structure. Um, the interesting thing also is the cell walls are a major strategy for antibiotics. 
So when you're thinking about antibiotics, a lot of times people would be like, well, wait a minute. So what does an antibiotic actually do, right? What does it go after? Well, what it actually tends to go after is it tends to go after components of the cell wall because of all the things in a bacterium that stick out like a sore thumb is like, oh, hey, this is unique. It's the components of the cell wall. And that's what antibiotics go after. And this also basically creates the different types of antibiotics because the different types of prokaryotes will have different cell wall structures. And so you have specific families of antibiotics that are designed to go after that specific wall construction. Okay. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you have the big bad wolf going after the three little pigs, right? So the big bad wolf, him and his breathy self, is going to be pretty effective against the straw house, right? So that's one type of antibiotic maybe not as effective against the wood house, but that one, you, you basically have a different family of wolves that basically is a pyromaniac and you'll basically be able to burn that one down, right? So that's pretty effective. So there's a different strategy, different group of antibiotics. And then of course you can do the brick house. So neither the first two are gonna be effective on that one, right? So you can't burn the brick house down because bricks don't burn and you can't blow it down because it's brick. So you need what? Another family of antibiotics specifically targeting that construction of wall, in which case comes in the wolf with the wrecking ball, right? The C4, I like that one, right? That's, I like your version better, but since we already did a pyromaniac in the second one, um, uh, although I do like the C4 thing, but um, right? So that would be like, hang on to the C4. I want to kind of circle back around on that because I just thought of something. Right, so the wrecking ball. So that one would be effective against the brick house, right? So you wouldn't use fire on the brick. That'd be a bad choice, right? And then you have another wolf, a fourth wolf, who has something that will pretty much take them all down. Now here's your C4 guy, right? C4 will effectively take down the straw house, the wood house, and the brick house, and anything else, right? Because C4 is pretty powerful, right? Yeah, so that one would be kind of like your broad spectrum antibiotic. Not necessarily specifically targeting any given house, but capable of bringing down a broad spectrum of them, right? And so that's part of the reason why antibiotics is a bit of a trick and a bit of a guessing game. So if you've ever gone to the doctor and it doesn't look like or sound like they know what they're doing with the antibiotics, because any decent, honest doctor will tell you that they don't. Because number one, they don't have any clue what bacteria you're dealing with. So they're not quite sure which antibiotic is going to be the proper fit. They can only guess. And so what do they do? Trial and error. Well, let's try this one. That is true, that is true. Um, yeah, well that's basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, results based medicine, right? So I can tell you right now the admissions to med school will go like way down if we ever move to that system. Um, and it would be almost impossible to find a doctor because nobody in their right mind would ever want to practice medicine. Um, because to be quite honest with you, if we switch to results based medicine, nobody would make money in medicine because Western medicine is not results based. All it is is symptom management. Basically, they keep you comfortable while your body does the work. And most doctors have no clue how that works. They just be like, well, I can give you this and it'll make you feel better while you work your way through it. Oh, great. So you're trying to tell me that something I got for free from my parents is actually doing all the hard lifting while I give you a bunch of money. Just to feel a bit better. That's what I'm saying. Right? I mean, you can go on the street corner and buy like recreational drugs and they do the same thing, right? Basically, a pusher is doing almost exactly the same thing as most Western doctors. The only difference is one is licensed and the other one isn't. Wow, that's really cynical. Okay, good. <laughs> Lysing, yeah, bursting. So to lice something is to burst it or cut it open. Yes, L-Y-S-I-N-G, correct. Okay, so, so that's, um, so that's, they're going after the cell wall structure, right? And of course you have your little capsule, which can be jelly-like, or it can be somewhat stiffer. So it can have different consistencies around that capsule, but that's also protection, by the way. So you notice you have a couple of layers of protection, right? 
which is there for a reason. Why? Because it's a prokaryote. Guess what? You live in a dangerous world. Oh, guess what? You don't have any parents to protect you. And not only that, guess what? Everything is out to kill you. Everything. Right? Everybody's immune system is out to kill you. Even other bacteria are out to kill you. So it's a dangerous world. It's not for the faint of heart if you're going to be a prokaryote. So what do you do? You armor up, right? I mean, you put on, you know, the, the, the chain mail. That's one layer of armor. You put on the tuna can. That's another layer of armor. And you put on a tuna can for the tuna can. That's another layer of armor. And then what do you do? You get inside a Sherman tank. That's another layer of armor. And then what do you do? Then you get inside the bunker that's sealed off like NORAD, right? So there's a couple layers of protection there, yes? Thank you. Yeah, so that's basically what bacteria are doing. Why? Because everybody wants to kill you, uh, which is actually, NORAD's a good example, right? Because what hap what's gonna happen as soon as nuclear war breaks out, where, where are the bad guys gonna go for? They're gonna look for NORAD because they know that the president is there pulling all the strings, right? They know if they can take out NORAD, then strategically they've scored a massive hit to the, to the U.S. military machine. That's exactly why NORAD is buried in a mountain that nobody really knows where it is. And if you try to go find it, you probably get shot. You know, it's for a reason, right? So don't go wandering around. There's some places you just don't go in this country. There's no such thing as freedom there, right? You don't go near NORAD unless you're suicidal. Or any military. You don't go Area 51, right, unless you're suicidal, because people actually have been shot. It's on the record, actually. They have been shot for getting too close to it. Like, not like, you know, like knocking on the door to get into the alien compound, right? Like, we're talking about all you did was just, like, touch the fence that's, like, about 20, 35 miles away from any building. Then they shoot you, right? So, I mean, we're talking, like, hair trigger. So, any countries like that, by the way. You know, don't mess with the unmessable. Uh, don't forget about the Bill of Rights. Forget about the Constitution. When it comes to that level, there is no such thing as democracy. That's every country is the same that way. We're just delusional enough to believe that, well, we can actually just waltz right on in there. Well, my government doesn't Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Why would they ever lie to us? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it depends on what your interpretation of a lie is. Right? One person's lie is another person's truth. It's all relative after all, right? Well, it's all correct. If you think of it. Yeah. So, um, so archaea, these are different, right? So what we've been talking about up to this point has been kind of basic stuff like E. coli, salmonella, staph, those sorts of things, right? The things we're commonly uh, running into, but archaea is a little bit different. Um, they don't have a peptide glycan wall like most prokaryotes do. It's a little bit different. Theirs is composed of polysaccharides like starches and things like that and proteins separately. So it's not a fusion molecule. It's a combination, a gamish of two, right? Carbohydrates and proteins together. Now, the thing about archaea is it's part of it is it's part prokaryote and part eukaryote. This is what kind of makes it a little on the strange side. Right. There's some things, very strong things, but it's like, oh, hey, this is a prokaryote, right? Like, for instance, the absence of organelles and things of that nature. But then there's aspects of archaea that look very eukaryotic. And we didn't realize that until later when we just when we understood the processes. But for instance, you know, most of um, archaea, like in terms of the definition of it, like there's no nucleus, that's true, that's prokaryotic. There's no organelles, that's true, that's prokaryotic. Um, the cell walls are very non-eukaryotic. They're not like prokaryotes, they're not like bacteria, but they're very non-eukaryotic. So they're kind of somewhere in between. But what we noticed is that the lipids that they use are a little bit different than bacteria. That kind of sets them apart from the other prokaryotes. And the other thing that's weird is some of their basic processes like DNA replication, which we have in chapter four at the end of the semester, protein synthesis, which is the last chapter we cover in the semester. These guys aren't the way prokaryotes do it, it's the way the eukaryotes do it. So archaea seems to have a lot of resemblances to prokaryotes, but then a lot of the way they do business is like eukaryotes. 
So they're kind of somewhere in between, which is the reason why they have their own domain. And so I kind of think of like Arkea as kind of being like one of those little optical illusion pictures, right? Like where you see the two faces facing each other or you see the cup, right? It's kind of like that. And it's like half the time you see one and half the time you see the other. And you're not quite sure which one is which. It's like, well, wait a minute, should I put this in the face pile or should I put this in the cup pile, right? But half the time you're seeing both, right? It's like, okay, I see face now, but no, wait, now I'm seeing cup, but, but no, wait, now I'm seeing face. Now I'm seeing cup and you're going back and forth. Your brain is like, like going on like short circuit mode. So what do you do? You create its own section. This is part face, part cup. Okay, so let's take a look at the flagella. So the flagella is basically kind of a, it's kind of an extension. It's uh, not, it's not, a, not structured the same as pil uh, the pillus, but it's like a fiber that's associated with the actual cell, but it tends to be fairly long. And the flagella basically has a very common um, role to play. Its role is motion, locomotion that is. So this is how a cell moves around. This is its swimming mechanism. So some prokaryotes will have it, some don't, uh, many of them do, but it's always when it's there, it's always for movement. These guys are designed to let these uh, prokaryotes move around in water. And so the flagella, which we're going to kind of uh, break down now, uh, I want you to hang on to because we're going to revisit the flagella again at the end of the chapter, but we're going to be taking a look at the eukaryotic flagella. And we're going to take a look at some of the compares and contrasts between the prokaryotic flagellum and the eukaryotic flagellum, because they're both functionally for the same purpose, motion, locomotion, but structurally they're different. So the um, prokaryotic flagellum acts like a rotary system, very similar to a boat propeller, right? Which basically rotates like this and creates propulsion, right? So the same thing is true for the prokaryotic motion. Now, obviously nothing comes for free. So if you're gonna be spinning this propeller, you have to pony up what? Yeah, so you'd better have a plan. That is an energetic plan. So notice this is one of the reasons why our energetic plan is the first starting point for all biology. Decide what your salary is gonna be for your life. And then you organize your life economics around that. So if I'm going to teach for a living, then I'm committing myself to a 15 year old board escape. Now, if I had chosen differently and I wanted to be like, not this is every day, I don't have the body for this, but like if I wanted to be a player for the Denver Broncos, you know, maybe a kicker, <laughs> not fast enough to be a DB, water boy perhaps, right? Um, that's a, a thing, right? But I would offer you to make a lot more money. And so I would be able to afford the Bentley. But notice what you get is all made, those decisions are laid down early on. So what you choose to do or be to become dictates what you can do and what your full flower looks like, okay? And this is about me and my full flower. This is as good as it gets. So. I don't get any richer than this, not without breaking laws. Um, yeah, right, right, yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have enough chemistry knowledge to pull that one off. Um, so, and nobody wants biology. Like, hey, I'll make you a, a cell in the back alley. It's like, why? It's like, they'll just shoot you, right? They'll just, yeah. I watched just enough of Breaking Bad to know that he was good enough to avoid getting killed. Yeah, barely. Yeah, so, and, but that was the one thing that saved him. It's like, I remember the one scene where it's like, well, do you want the New York Yankees? Or do you want, I don't know what he's talking about, some like Bush League minor like team. He's basically talking about whose drugs do you want, minor or the other guys. Basically, it was like if they chose the other guy, they were going to shoot him, essentially. So I just remember that scene. And I'm all like, I'd be, I'd, de I'd be dead. That would be me. I'd be dead. That would, I, that would be the end of it for me. Um, but anyway. Um, so yeah, but I don't really have marketable skills. This is pretty much all I can do. So I'm a one trick pony. There's really nowhere else to go from here. But anyway, boy, now I'm depressed. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's like maybe you guys can give me some career counseling, right? So you guys are like, 
No, no, unfortunately, I wish that were true, but so this is what it looks like. Scary looking, yes? Okay, let's take a look at it. So here's your plasma membrane, right? Everybody's got to have one, right? That's, that's necessary equipment. And then uh, for the prokaryotic uh, plasma membrane, you're going to have your cell wall, right? So you're going to have um, a couple of features here. So the inner portion is going to be your peptidoglycan cell wall. That's kind of like your cell wall proper. But the cell wall complex, if you will, has a couple of layers to it. It has your cell wall proper, which is your peptidoglycan layer. That's kind of an internal layer. And then it's got this outer layer that's a slightly different construction than the peptidoglycan layer. That's an extra layer on top of it. Uh, that's technically part of the cell wall complex, but there's like two very distinct layers to it. That's this, this outer membrane. They're calling it an outer membrane. And, and in micro, you get into the deep woods on the structure of the whole complex and the different layers and things like that. So that's not necessary for us. All we want to really know is that inside this membrane cell wall structure, we've got protein. So this purple thing um, is basically representative of protein. So it's a cartoon for protein. So you have these proteins, like these little drum-like proteins that form these like little disc-like rings. You have an inner ring and outer ring that's embedded in the plasma membrane. And then in the middle of those ring-like structures is a shaft-like protein that then extends through another set of rings that are now embedded in the wall complex, the two layers of the wall complex. Now, these rings have the capacity to rotate and spin around the shaft, basically kind of like this, right? So kind of like spinning around the shaft. Um, actually, they're going like this, right? Like that. And on the external side of this, you're gonna see this kind of hook-like, sheath-like protein with ultimately your long filamentous flagellar fiber in the middle of it, okay? It almost kind of looks like um, a cross-section of a hair, actually, if you look at it. Uh, but the important thing to notice that's a, a unique feature of this is the bend. So basically the prokaryotic flagellum is bent like that. So what happens is when you feed it some energy, and in this case, your energy is coming from a concentration gradient uh, from a proton gradient. And so it's, it's, it has the same physics as a hydroelectric dam where you allow some sort of an energetic molecule to flow downhill, release its energy, and you harvest that energy to spin these little rotary drums. And when they do that, what's gonna happen is they're going to basically turn your little hooked flagellum. And so as it starts to, uh, as that energy starts to flow through the system, that's gonna start to turn in a circle. And then as it starts to turn, it's gonna turn faster and faster and faster. And then pretty soon you're gonna get that little rotary exactly like a propeller kind of a situation, which is gonna propel you through the water. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is that propeller motion. So that pushes in this direction, which causes the organism to go in that direction. Because right? that's what the propeller does. It actually, it's like, it's pushing against the water, which pushes you in the opposite direction. Right? So that's kind of what's happening. And so you can see, it's a, basically a, just a couple of things that you need, though, in order to get this done is, number one, the correct orientation of the proteins, the bend, and the energetics. That's true for any system that you build, right? If you want to build some sort of like a mechanical toy or something like that, you have to have the right structure for it. And you also have to have the ability to energize it. Okay, And there's lots of different options to energize these things. Um, but this is the particular choice that bacteria made is with this sort of hydroelectric dam type of a system. Um, so that's it for prokaryotes. Now the rest is eukaryotic territory. Okay, so let's take a look at the eukaryotes. So what sets these guys apart? What's the innovation here? First of all, there's a couple of things that really sets eukaryotes. I mean, like the game changer. Like if you sat down and you said, okay, so how come eukaryotes are like so so much better than prokaryotes. And we're not talking about a little bit. Of course, we're eukaryotes, so I'm, I'm biased, but right. I mean, so, but why are they so much better? Well, there's a couple of things in there. I'm going to highlight a couple of things in the eukaryotic cell that really sets it apart. It's like the main innovator. Um, obviously, one of the big innovations is the development of a nucleus. Well, why does that matter? 
Well, you got DNA, right? Does it matter if you put your clothes in a closet versus on the floor? If you ask the college student who lives in that dorm, their answer would be no, it doesn't make a difference. But tell them to go pick up that crumply, wrinkled up, although clean, shirt off the floor and wear that to a job interview. Then all of a sudden, does it matter? Yeah, right? Because you're probably, if you go in there looking like a slob, depending on what the job is, right? If it's a white collar job, guess what? You have no, no chance, right? Because that's your first impression. That's true, right? So your first impression of walking through the door is oftentimes the most lasting, especially in a situation like that where they're having to judge you on first impressions, okay? So that obviously then says, okay, so that matters then. So if I want a really highfalutin job, then I need to tighten up a little bit, right? So I need to iron my shirts. I need to make sure they clean and they don't smell like I haven't washed them in a couple of months, right? Right. I mean, all those are negatives on the hiring committee. They're going to be like, um, no, right? Of course, we all like to believe that we are all good judges of character, that it doesn't matter what you look like because they're going to hire you based on your merits. That's a bull, that's bull dunk. We're human beings, which means the one thing that comes reflexively to us is judging others, right? And I can tell you right now, I mean, you get a slob of a candidate walking through the door versus somebody who is airtight. The slob has no chance, no chance in hell. Even if they're brilliant, sorry. There's a significant part of your reality where you feel like it's okay to look like that. And I don't want that part of your reality to be part of your job reality. Because that means I'm having to fire your ass. And I'd rather not do that. I'd rather hire you the first time and hire the right person than have to fire you. Because you're a slob in your job standards and your work ethic like you are in your dress. We like to think that's not true, but that's exactly the way it works. By the way, um, you don't, don't be proud or condescending because you know we all do that. We all do that every time we go into a doctor's office, don't we? We start sizing them up. So you're the nurse. You know, hold on one second. Let me just get a look at you before you even touch me. Because if I think you are a nitwit, then there is no way in hell I'm going to let you come anywhere near me. You do the same thing to the doctor, don't you? Right? If there's a doctor that you really respect, you're asking them questions. You're like, well, but what about this? And what about this? And you're listening, right? But you can tell, I can say, because I've seen this before in healthcare, I mean, all the time. You can tell when we've lost them because the doctor will be talking to them and the patient will be like, they're just like, you know what? I've already paid my copay. You just go ahead and keep talking because I'm not listening. I'm out. Because it's obvious that you don't know what you're doing. And it's pointless for me to ask a question because you don't know what you're doing. Nor, and it's also equally pointless for me to argue with you because you're so damn delusional that you honestly think that you know better than me. And I'm telling you right now, you don't because I'm the one that lives in my body not you Ooh. and all the doctors were like Ouch. right we've all been there haven't we we've all talked to doctors where they're like trying to basically pretend like they know more about you and your body than you do when you're the one living in it and having to deal with all the pains and miseries of it hang around doctors long enough those uh those dummies are a dime a dozen, which is the reason why there's so much consternation about healthcare is because the number of dumb doctors we produce is astronomical. A good doctor is really a jewel. You find a good doctor, hang on to them. If they retire, then go like, what about Bob? And move in. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, um... How, oh, how it's kind of, it seems like kind of how you're talking about, like, when we first started this class about how, like, never let your, um, like, your theory become, like, 
overrule it. I feel like doctors and nurses just get very confused very brainwashed into it. I, it's my assuming of what must be happening into their schooling. You know, they just get this very structured way that they lose the ability to like to think outside the box. You know, and well, that's the way we train. That's the way medicine is organized: is to train doctors to basically be robotic yeah. and to have answers. You train medical staff to have answers when they don't even know what the questions are, yeah. which really makes them come across as like, "Wow, you are just astronomically stupid," because you don't even know what the question is, and you're giving me a bunch of answers. We've all been there, right? So you're prescribing me all this crap, and you're like, "Do you even know?" what the question is? No, I don't think so, right? But that's just the way the entire medicine education system is. It's actually, I mean, it, you can tell I've got a research background, but I've got also a lot of healthcare background. So I don't like one clearly and I like the other much better. But um, yeah, I mean, the entire med school system is antiquated. It comes straight out of the 17th century literally and it hasn't changed much like at all um, and doctors aren't trained to solve problems they're trained to basically diagnose stuff that's all they're trained to do and doctors always have formulas for your symptom sets it's literally pretty brain dead it's a brain dead practice it's a practice it's not a science um, because they're trained to identify a spectrum of symptoms and just like you're bird watching, it's like, oh, that red and there's blue and it's a scarlet tanager or whatever, right? So it's like, that's all it is. It's basically just identification by your symptoms. And then based on that symptom set, then there are some prescribed formulas to treat that particular symptomology. That's what 90% of medicine is. So if you are outside the box and they can't figure it out, doctors can do nothing for you. Like they're not taught. No, they're not taught to solve problems. They're solved to identify stuff and to follow a therapeutic formula that is associated with that symptom set. The only ones that are actually trained to solve the problems are the researchers. But the issue with that is if I were to solve your problem, I would have to run all these tests as a researcher. Um, and I'm not talking about therapeutics. I'm just trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Right. And then the amount of time it would take to research you and what's going on with you would be a ridiculous amount of time. And we just, it's just practically not possible for as many people as we have. And that's the reason why medicine is kind of like a pretty much of a farce in some ways, especially now. It's even more acute now. Why? Because now for the first time we live in a generation where we don't need doctors, do we? Yeah, we, we have ourselves already diagnosed, don't we? Before we even walk into the doctor's office, like, uh, let me tell you what I think I've got. So here's the six that I think, right? This is the six that I think I've got. Pick one. We already know. And it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, Billy Bob or something like that. I mean, we're, I mean, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic. I mean, you know, the, you know, the, this is like, you know, professionals, people who are actually more educated than probably the doctor you're seeing are the ones who are saying, this could be it, this could be it, this could be it, right? So a lot of doctors are offended by that. Why? Yeah, because a lot of doctors are just basically a big wad of ego with very little intelligence. And you influence them. They have to, right? Yeah. Because they're coming out with a couple hundred grand of debt. So they kind of have, they don't have a choice that they have to be. But then of course they buy the yacht and they buy like the super sports car and the big house. I'm like, um, so you do realize your debt hole is getting bigger. I know, right? It's like, how much debt do you have? That should be part of the medical profile. It's just yes. You just so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, do you have debt? And does that affect your diagnosing? It shouldn't, but I can tell you it does. Because there's, I've worked with some cardiologists where they definitely, they don't recommend. They, they pretty much say, if you're going to see me, you're going to do this test, right? So, because that's the money, 
tests and they've got doors to keep open and salaries to pay and and school loans to pay off so yeah right well and doctors are starting to slide into the same sewer that lawyers are in as far as i'm concerned yeah lawyer hell the lawyers sort of started you know kind of laid the foundations of hell started the fires a little bit and then we're going to toss a few doctors in there um then you know pretty much it's just going to go from there i mean all of us are going to end up there and then we're just going to be fodder for the flames now that that is encouraging isn't it isn't that an encouraging little piece right there there's a reason why you guys sit like as far away from me as possible right so kind of, it's, like, it's like um it's got to get away from this guy but anyway <laughs> so um <clears throat> So this basically um, also leads to not just membrane bound nucleus, but also organelles, right? So these are basically compartments that will answer a question of life. Not all, one of them, right? So what's the key here? Are prokaryotics not answering those questions? No, they're answering them. They wouldn't be alive if they weren't, right? So what's the difference here? Organization. We've all seen this, haven't we? A good organizational strategy, division of labor, we call it, can be critical in increasing productivity for very little cost. Think about it. We've increased our productivity in this room by, by compartmentalization. How so, you might ask. Well, imagine what we actually have here, and a room. Now, let's just start off with just the room, an empty room. All of you guys come in. You're just sort of standing around. No place to sit, no desk, nothing. Empty room. Wall, ceiling, carpet, right? You'll have some productivity associated with it, right? But did we increase your productivity by giving you a little workstation? Something to write on? A place to put your things so that you can be a little bit more organized? The same thing's also true in business, right? You got this, you rent this big old open floor plan. And then what's the first thing you do? You build cubicles. Why? Because if you just have a bunch of people in there just milling about, it's going to be chaos and very unproductive, right? Nobody's going to know what's going on. But when you kind of create organization, this is the copy room. So all of your copying needs, you go there. So stay out of the way of the computer people, right? Because they're over here. This is your little area where you're working on your project. So you don't have to lose them in the midst of all the hubbub because you can keep your separate from your peers. So all you did in that space was just compartmentalize it and divide up labor, right? Um, a good example is a good episode of The Office, right? You gotta love that show. I almost would have guessed the thing you're gonna bring up. Shrew, <laughs> I love yeah. Shrew. Um, Shrew's my, Shrew, I love Shrew. He's like any kind of mega, uh, mega, uh, mega maniacal, um, like office jockey is just like hysterical. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, the whole scrape over, you know, assistant manager versus assistant to the manager. <laughs> I mean, that's just hilarious. I'm like, dude, 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 this is, that's, as, that's as big as you get. I mean, you gotta get a little bigger than that. Um, but that's a good example, right? I mean, when you take a look at an episode of The Office, does it look a little chaotic in there? I mean, there's a place where Jim sits. And then, of course, you got Schrute. And then, you know, you got Stanley over here on the other side and Kevin, I look at. Um, right? So, I mean, they kind of have their places to sit, but it's kind of a little chaotic, right? I mean, they're still kind of milling all over the place. It's still kind of a little chaotic. So not the best organization, is it? It would be better actually if they were separated, compartmentalized so that Jim and Schrute don't like evil eyeing each other all the time, right? And then Jim would be able to focus 
on what he's doing. And same thing with Schrute and same thing. Well, Stanley kind of does anyway already. Right. So they would kind of have like their own offices and their own space so they can do what they need to do. So you can see that organization can be better there, but all you would do is increase productivity by organizing and dividing up labor. Okay. The one thing about the office, because all it is is just about interpersonal dynamics in an office, is you don't really get a sense of what each of them do. I mean, yeah, they're all sales, but some of them are, some of them aren't, right? But there's not a really clear view of like, okay, wait a minute. So who's your sales territory, Jim? Because if you're calling the same people as Dwight, then that's redundancy, right? If you've got the same accounts, then usually in sales, there's a strategy, right? You go for, you're in charge of corporate accounts, right? This big and bigger. You're in charge of the mom and pop stuff. You're in charge of managing and organizing our footprint in box stores, like Walmarts and office depots and things like that, because they were a paper stationary company. Don't remember what love it, right? Um, so that's kind of, so there's a strategy to that, right? But you never caught any of that in the actual episode because they were all just sort of, just kind of all blown together, right? But in a real office, they, they would probably have much more specific roles and they'd be cordoned off and they would be responsible for each one of those little pieces, okay? And that would be good organization. So what this gives you then is this division of labor, which allows you to really be productive. Um, the other thing that also stands out for eukaryotes, and these are the two, the biggies. Like if I had to say, okay, tell me two things that really makes a eukaryote like head and shoulders above the prokaryotes. Two things that you would answer. Number one, the endomembrane system. We're going to talk about that actually in just a second. <clears throat> Number two, the side of skeleton. So cells don't have eukaryotic cells, this external cell wall, except for plants, right? Especially animals in particular. But oftentimes in animals in particular, we have a cytoskeleton, an internal skeleton inside the cell. That's innovation. That's crazy talk. That's crazy talk. Okay. These two stick out like a sore thumb. Okay. It's kind of like us. Like if you were to take a look at a human being, right? We're like the dominant mammal on the planet, right? So the question is, well, what makes us stand out? Think about it. As mammals, we're pretty pathetic. We don't really have any teeth. We don't have any claws. We paint them for crying out loud. That's about as good as we get with our claws, right? So um, we, uh, we're not very strong. We're not very big. We're not very fast. Those are all things that most mammals need to have in order to survive. Oh yeah, by the way, we also look funny, which means we can't camouflage very well. So what's keeping all 8 billion of us from becoming mammal burgers? What is the one thing that makes us stand out head and shoulders above everything else? which from which from which comes innovation right so it's the space between our ears that sets us apart and it's such a profound innovation right that's just that word in there, right that it is like an astronomical advantage because we can't fight our way out of a paper sack we get into the middle of a bear hug and it is goodbye right? If we get on the business end of a lion, it's over. We have no capacity to fight our way out of anything. But that's not the way we live, is it? We live by being two or three steps ahead of the lion and the bear. Because what the lion and the bear don't know is that we know exactly what they're going to do, like three moves ahead. We're playing four-dimensional chess and they're playing checkers, right? That's how we live. Does it always work? Of course not, because we may be unlucky and we may be caught out in the open with a nice grizzly bear in front of us 
in which case we're screwed. Yeah, mountain lions, right? Because you don't even know the mountain lion's there. By the time you realize the mountain lion's there, you're probably in the process of passing out because you've lost that much blood. A pet, yeah, they're cute. They are kind of cute, but they're, yeah, they, they like, they like the, yeah, they, they like to chew on you a little bit. So that's their downfall, right? So they're kind of like a, a cat, only they like to, instead of scratch at you, they like to sort of like cut your carotid and just like make you bleed out. And then they like to gorge on your organs afterwards. So that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a downside there. So not the, <laughs> not the best house cat in the world, although still cute, right? Yeah. So at least while you're dying, you'll be like, well, at least a cute cat killed me, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of something as you black out. But anyway, um, right? So that's basically the innovations we have, just like our brain is the innovation for us among mammals, right? Because otherwise we're pretty pathetic otherwise. So those are the big ones. And they seem like small things, but those kind of innovations are actually the theme amongst eukaryotes. So eukaryotes, for instance, if you take a look at it, we start off with, okay, like DNA replication is a good example. We saw this one on the previous list, right? So everybody has to do DNA replication. Why? Because you have to do it in order to be able to propagate yourself. So you have to do DNA replication. So everybody does it. The prokaryotes pull it off and they have a particular way of doing DNA replication. And then the eukaryotes do it in a similar fashion, but then they add a bunch of extra bells and whistles, okay? Um, and that's kind of the thing with eukaryotes. That's kind of what they do. They, they take similar themes, but then they build on it, right? It's kind, of like, um, it's kind of like Mozart's variations on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, right? How many of you guys have heard the cute little kid's tune, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? By the way, it's also the same thing as the ABC song, right? Just if you're keeping track, it's, it's the same. Well, Mozart was, well, of course, I'm a Mozart file, but um, right. I mean, the, the fun thing about Mozart is he actually wrote a series of variations on that theme, which is a French theme, actually, originally, before we renamed it Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And when you do variations, it's actually kind of interesting because you start off with just a basic melody. Dun, 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 dun. And that's the first movement, right? And then the second variation is basically you're just screwing around with it. I mean, you're just like, and, and the nice thing about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star Variations is he wrote that for his piano students. So, so he was actually writing between the two hands, teaching his students how to use right and left hands and they're playing. And so you could hear him, he'll go off and he'll start doing this very simple on the left hand. And then he'll just gotta do all these crazy things with the right. And then the next variation will be, he keeps the right hand very simple and he goes all these crazy things on the left. And then the next one is he'll do crazy things with both. And then the next one is he'll kind of like do echo, answer, response, like ding, 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 you know, like that kind of thing. And then he'll cross them over. And then, I mean, he does all these crazy things throughout these 12 variations. And it's kind of a really good example of how prokaryotes and eukaryotes work. Prokaryotes are these simple twinkle, twinkle, little star. Eukaryotes take them and turn them into Mozart, right? That's kind of what eukaryotes do. So now you guys are gonna wanna hear, yeah, you wanna hear that now, right? Um, I'll play it for you, actually. I did this last semester in lab. So on Friday, remind me, I'll play Mozart's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star Variation. It's actually kind of fun. Um, so <clears throat> what do you carry off cells have? Well, some of these are Yadel. We already covered it, right? Entry stuff. You got to have your plasma membranes, right? That's part of all cells. You got to have those. Got to have cytoplasm. We already covered that one, right? So if you're going to be a cell, you got to have that one. Um, what about the rest? So this is unique, right? This is a eukaryotic thing. Everybody has this. But now organelles, membrane bound organelles, by which we mean, that's a eukaryotic thing. That's new. Cytoskeleton, that's new, right? These are the inventions, right? Nucleus, that's new. This is the invention, right? So these are all eukaryotic inventions to what is normally a prokaryotic foundation. So this is the this shows you the pattern, right? This is your prokaryotic foundation, and this is your eukaryotic innovation. And that's the way it works. That's the pattern we see throughout the semester. The simple way the prokaryotes do it, and then we add it and trick it out, and that's the eukaryotes. Okay. So let's take a look then at the rest of the chapter. 
Okay, first of all, we have these two slides. One is a plant cell, one is an animal cell. Which one's which? And this is? How do you know this is a plant cell? The cell wall, the cell wall right? What else? Chloroplast, that's another one, exactly. What else? There's one more. Not so much the peroxisomes. Well, there's still peroxisomes in the other one. No, those are two different things. So animals still have peroxisomes. Lysosomes are different than peroxisomes. We'll actually cover lysosomes or peroxisomes in this chapter. Right, that big old central vacuole in the middle of the cell. Notice, take a look at the animal cell. Cell wall? Nope. Are there any chloroplasts? Nothing. Is there a big central vacuole in there? Mm -mm. But there's a lot here, isn't there? Wow, let's just take that in for a second. I know what you guys are thinking. Your breathing stopped a little bit, didn't it? And you're wondering. That's what you're trying not to say it too loudly, but that's kind of what you're muttering on your breath. The answer is yes. You need to know all this because these are all the working parts of the cell. Now, we are gonna spend the rest of the chapter unpacking all this, right? But this is like the table of contents. It's like the visual table of contents for the rest of the chapter, pretty much. And I also like to park it here to kind of tell you guys a little bit of a strategy to utilize because this is a really good example of this. A lot of times in a chapter like this, when you kind of start to feel the overwhelmingness of everything, is you're saying like, wait a minute, okay, so how am I supposed to study for this? Um, it's very simple. What you want to do is you want to organize your information. There's going to be a lot coming at you in a very short period of time. So the best thing to do when you have that landslide information coming at you is to figure out a good strategy to index your information. So it makes it easier for your brain to access. Images like this are ones that you should key in on because these are what I call information dense images. So when you see a slide like this, you can see there's a lot going on here. It captures a large swath of the chapter and it's visual. Not only that, but you've got a lot of detail here, yes? And so if you were to take this slide and use it as sort of your main tool to sort of study and memorize the attributes of each of these organelles, then on an exam, when you're likely to call up an image, like this slide, for instance, oftentimes what'll happen is your visual will bring the information with it. So your brain has an easier time calling up visual information. Because even for auditory learners, we are still visual creatures. It's our dominant sense. So we're more likely to recall in our brain a picture or an image before a word. But if we use that picture to associate a word with it, we will bring the word along for the ride. So if you remember this image in your brain and you can pull this out in good detail, oftentimes all the rest of the stuff will come along with it. Oh, and it gets better. As you study through the chapter, add new lines of detail. Use this image to study the detail that's right there and keep adding every single time you go through a study session, a new line. The more lines of detail you add to your image, the more information your brain's gonna be able to pull up with this image. In a good chapter, you can maybe remember a good half dozen maybe pictures, and pretty much call up most of the information in the chapter. <clears throat> the more that information your brain can get access to, the more likely you're gonna be able to answer questions correctly. That's the reason why this is an important picture. Use this to maximum advantage, okay, in your studies. Okay, 
Let's take a look <coughs> at I'm uh, I'm debating whether or not I want to add a slide, but I will. <clears throat> and this is going to go fast. And I don't want to spend a lot of time unpacking because we're going to unpack it when we get to these pieces. I just want to do like a little bit of an outline to go along with that mess. Yes. And we'll kind of go back and forth to it. Kind of helps you give you some organization. So kind of to double down on that idea. Organelles grouped by function. When you take a look at all the organelles, including all of these guys, you can basically take all these organelles and you can cluster them to, into four major groups of function. The first one, the first major group of function is gonna be the informational molecules, the informational organelles. In this group, we have, excuse me, that's gonna be one, Obviously, the nucleus, right? And the nucleus, this basically houses your DNA. And then in this group as well, you've also got the nucleolus. And uh, this is basically an aggregation of ribosomal RNA. We'll talk more about this and unpack the details when we get to the section in the chapter. I just wanna sort of lay it all out here, so it's gonna go fast. And then also in addition, this is where the ribosomes are, right? This is the protein synthesis factories. So that's what these guys are, right? These are all based on information transfer. The next major group is this endomembrane system. This is one of those innovations of eukaryotes. It's a system that links several organelles together. And the first organelle that you start off with is the endoplasmic reticulum. We're going to talk about that. And there's two different types of endoplasmic reticulum. There's rough ER, which is involved in protein synthesis. And we'll talk about how that differs from ribosomes. And there's smooth ER. Nucleolus up here. It says nucleolus. Aggregation. Yep, of ribosomal RNA. So the smooth ER has three different functions. So it has calcium storage. We're gonna talk a little bit about that function. It also has a detox activity. We'll talk a little bit about that one as well. And then it has lipid synthesis. So beyond that, then we're gonna have what's called, I'm gonna add this in here as part of it because I wanna create a, a, a single linear chain of events. That's what I'm gonna to try to set up here. We have what's called a transport vesicle, which is basically a membrane bubble. That carries a crude, not ready for its job, a crude protein. That's gonna then go to the next major organelle, which is the Golgi apparatus which has a couple of major functions. So it basically will sort, ship, and modify proteins. And then it'll give way to a secretory vesicle which is a membrane bubble that carries the finished protein. Now, typically, 
these guys together creates what's called the secretory pathway. We're going to study the secretory pathway as a as a mechanism to study the endomembrane system. Um, now, generally speaking, there's two other organelles that I like to add on to this one um, because they're related to it in production, not in terms of function. So in terms of production, you also have your lysosome, right? Which is basically the garbage disposal of the cell. We'll talk about what that means. And uh, the other one is the peroxisome. And what it does is it detoxes oxygen byproducts. Number three, the energetic organelles. Sometimes peroxisomes are listed in this group because they have to do with oxygen and energetics and stuff like that. I just put them in here because of the functionality. It's a natural extension from the endomembrane system. But here it's pretty straightforward, right? You have mitochondria. And the role of mitochondria is to make ATP, which we got introduced to last chapter, right? And you also have chloroplasts, which basically does photosynthesis. Now these have their own chapters, right? Chapter seven for mitochondria, chapter eight for photosynthesis. But they're the energetic organelles. And then the last grouping is the cytoskeleton. The other innovation, the big one, right? And this basically is support structure. Just like your skeleton is a support structure for your body, this is your support structure for yourself. So you have three major fibers. In order of size, you have microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. And we'll talk about the biological role and application of each three of you know, those three um, later on in the chapter. So that's just kind of like a little bit of an outline. So a combination of this for visual reference combined with this for indexing reference. Notice what I did. I took, now that's not all the chapter. We actually have a couple of other things after this to cover like cell junctions, for instance, at the end of it, that's usually the end of the chapter here. But this covers an enormous chunk, an enormous focus of chapter four. Notice what I did. I took a lot of function and I basically organized it into a major kind of an outline of function, right? Into major groupings. That alone is gonna help your brain be able to sort through everything and sort of like, okay, so this is the section, the informational molecules. This is the section, the endomembrane one. This is the section, the energetic one. This is the section, the cytoskeleton. So that immediately will allow your brain to kind of help organize and sort all this information. So it has a place to live, okay? So you have an organizational outline to sort of place everything along with a visual outline that will tell you what the context in space looks like in a cell, okay? So that's the only reason why I do the outline is so that you guys have that kind of organizational outline. This is what I mean. Like whenever I go to a chapter, Always sit down and try to outline, look through the chapter and outline the major themes. Every chapter in every science textbook is usually written with two or three major themes associated with it, right? And you should break everything down and subdivide it out into an outline to help you organize yourself. So it makes your brain a little more efficient in terms of tackling the uh, load of information that's coming at you, okay? So let's take a look at um, the beginning of the informational stuff, right? And, and probably the most important, the nucleus, right? So we already know that uh, the nucleus is basically where your DNA is gonna live, right? So this is where it's gonna be housed. 
um, generally speaking, most of our cells have a single nucleus. Some of them have more, like your skeletal muscles will have more than one nucleus, but for the most part, there's one nucleus. And also in here, inside the nucleus is gonna be a nucleolus. Now this is an aggregation, it's a pileup of ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is actually a structural component of ribosomes. So if you see a cell with a lot of nuclei, nucleoli in there, that means it's busy making the factories that will make proteins. So you are busy at making proteins. That's what that's saying. So if you've got a lot of nucleoli in there, and generally speaking, what will happen is a nucleolus, if you take a look at a nucleus like this, a nucleolus will generally look like kind of a little dark spot in the nucleus itself. And you have two, three, depending on how much you're doing, but that's a nucleus. It's not membrane bound. It's just like a little con uh, concentration of this ribosomal RNA in there. The nucleus itself is gonna be bound by a phospholipid bilayer envelope. It's gonna have two of them. It's gonna have an inner membrane, a little bit of a space, and then it's gonna have an outer membrane. So that's what's called your nuclear envelope. This is like a little double membrane system that envelops um, the nucleus. And of course, all your DNA inside there, okay? Now, with a membrane, obviously, and with a nucleus, you can't just have your DNA just sort of hidden away in there, right? That'd be kind of like taking information, putting it in a steel box, and basically sinking it into a bunch of cement. It's not going to be terribly useful in there, is it? So you need access to that money, just like you need access to your DNA. So what that means is if you need access to it, then you're going to basically blow a couple of holes in here, pores, so that things can come in and things can go out. Right? Because after all, you need access to your DNA. Your DNA is a working document because you're busy building stuff. You're busy building tissue and structure. So you need access to that information to tell you how to build it. And so the nuclear pores basically will allow you passage into and out of the nucleus. Um, typically in eukaryotes, we have what's called linear chromosomes. So a chromosome will basically be one linear line. And generally speaking, it'll have a little constriction point called the centromere that we usually write as a, like a little circle. So if, you, if I were to draw this as a chromosome, it'd be kind of like, there's usually like one end of a chromosome, a little constriction point, and another end of a chromosome like that. So this right here would be the centromere. You'd have a short arm, which we refer to as P, long arm, which we refer to as Q. That's just a notational thing we did in human genetics, the short arm and the long arm. But the idea is your DNA, which looks like this, we learned about this in the last chapter, right? Is actually doesn't look like that in a practicing cell. Why? Because a nucleotide is going to be a very delicate structure, right? So you don't wanna just grab your DNA and yank on it because it's gonna be like pulling on a cobweb, right? You pull on that cobweb, what's gonna to happen to it? It just disintegrates, right? Because it's mostly dust. DNA is the same way. So you don't wanna just have naked DNA molecule because it's really, really delicate. So what you do is you complex DNA along with proteins. And we call that structure chromatin. So chromatin is your chromosomes, your DNA, plus the protein component, which are essentially made out of a protein called histones. And this is what it looks like. So you basically have these protein that form complexes of eight histones that form like a little protein drum-like structure. Okay, these are like little protein complexes shaped like little drums made out of eight of these individual proteins called histones. Your DNA then winds around each one of these little drums. And the DNA wrapped around those protein drums is protected from damage. And so this whole structure right here is what's called a nucleosome. But this is what your DNA looks like in a nucleus. It's basically active DNA. This is how you're using it under normal circumstances. Okay. So it's got a little bit of protein in there, a little bit of DNA in there. The protein is designed to be complex to DNA to protect it. But notice it's got open ranges here so that you can have access to your information when you need it. And you can add more protein to it and wad up that DNA to really protect it, or you can loosen that up a little bit so you can get more access. 
So the nice thing about chromatin, and actually chromatin has become a very, very hot topic in the last 20 years of research, because we realize that we can regulate how we utilize our DNA in the cell by modeling our chromatin. So if it's really loose, we can have lots of access to it, but we can shut down that access by, by balling it all up so it's inaccessible. And so we can control what we do in a cell by just literally messing with the structure of DNA. Okay. It's become a really, really big hot topic in general biology. So this is our nucleus. So here you can see, you've got your nucleus up here. You've got your nuclear envelope, which you can see is a two membrane system. Inside this guy right here is a nucleolus, but don't let that throw you off, right? Because for the 3D graphics makes it looks like it's a membrane bound structure. It's not, students oftentimes get thrown by that. This is just a little like area. It's just good aggregation. It's, there's no membrane there. It's not quite that well bounded, okay? It's kind of a little more amorphous than that. But uh, you can see this little kind of hazy blue irregularity, that's all chromatin, the chromosomes, the DNA and stuff like that that's in there. Um, and then you have your nuclear pores. So you can see your nuclear pore complex is here, basically just little protein openings that puncture a hole in the uh, nuclear envelope. And you can see the pore complex here. So you can see here is your inner membrane. Here's your outer membrane. This is your space right in there. And then basically what you do is you inject a protein uh, that's right next to each other and they kind of form this like little opening pore. So that it kind of creates this little round structure and then things can basically move through that little opening, that little pore. But notice what also you have. You have this kind of big protein sort of cytoskeletal fiber structure called a nuclear basket. And you have cytoskeletal filaments that kind of reach out and sort of connect to other things and kind of coordinate, and sort of reach out and grab onto other things that are outside of the nucleus. But what this does is basically you get regulated passage, not just passage, but regulated passage into the nucleus. And it's on a need to know basis. So if you take a look at this, not anybody can just wander into the nucleus. All right, think of it. It's like being in the Oval Office. I don't know about you guys, I've never been there. Why? Because I don't need to be there. The country doesn't need me to be in the Oval Office. It's not necessary. I have, they have no need for me, right? I could disappear tomorrow and nobody would care. Well, I mean, from a national, from a national level, not from your guys' level, but from a national level. Well, I don't know you guys might not care either, but uh, right, but from a national level, right? The country's not going to know I'm gone. Right, because entrance into the Oval Office is on a need-to-know basis. And typically, if you need to have access to the president, like his closest advisors, then you will have access to the Oval Office. And there are mechanisms to get you, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen the Oval Office door. I mean, the thing's like about that thick. I mean, it's like ridiculous. It's like crazy. It's like fascinating. It's like, wow, this is like a little bunker in your Oval Office, right? But you're not going to get in the Oval Office unless you need to be there. You don't just get to walk in there and be like, oh, hey, look, I'm in the Oval Office, take a selfie, right? No, you don't get to do that one. It's only if you belong there and you're needed there, do you get to go there. Otherwise, you don't go there. And that's, by the way, this isn't just for Joe Average like me. This is also for senators. This is also for like, you know, legislators, like representatives and like speakers of the house, like Pelosi, for instance. She didn't just get to walk on into the Oval Office, right? Even the top shot like Schumer, who's the top senator right now, doesn't get to just walk into the Oval Office when he wants to. It's by invitation only. And when you do go there, you've got business to do. You're there for a reason. And if that reason doesn't exist, guess what? You're out. Same thing's true for the nucleus. You don't just get to breeze on into the nucleus. You got to be there for a reason. You got business to do. You don't have business to do, you're out. Okay. So it's very regulated which makes sense, right? Why is, the, uh, why is the Oval Office so restricted in this country? Because of what? Because the president lives there, right? I mean, that's his house, right? That's, that's where he works. So that's where the president makes a lot of high level decisions. So it's, it's restricted because you, of the protection. Just the same thing's true for your DNA, right? You don't want every crazy half-baked Yahoo to just be able to breeze right on into the nucleus because they don't have it. They could be dangerous in there. 
right? We saw that on January 6th, right? <laughs> right? right? It got a little scary that day. But uh, even for those of us, you know, who were kind of watching it originally, it's kind of like, okay, they're kind of sympathetic to the idea of the whole free speech side of thing. But then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, you see people breaking it off as they're like, oh, wait, 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 I didn't, I didn't sign up for that one, right? That's going a little too far. But right, I mean, there's like this idea, it's like, okay, you don't just get access there, right? which is the reason why the dude who put his feet up on Pelosi's desk is in jail now, right? Because that's a restricted area. Why? To protect the Speaker of the House, right? The Speaker of the House, if you're wondering, is third in line for the presidency in terms of succession. Um, but you didn't know that. But you do now. <clears throat> so, right? So that's, that's how the poor works. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a couple of it. There's a couple of other things I want to look at, especially nuclear lamina. I want to take a look at that one. I want to break that one open a little bit and take a look at that nuclear envelope. We'll take a look at some of the structure of that nuclear envelope. We'll do that next time. Okay. Hopefully my notes are saved and I'll actually not have to ask you guys all the time. What am I doing? Yeah. <laughs>